to the School District of Waukesha's Board of Education Teaching and Learning Committee meeting for Tuesday, June 1st, 2021. Uh, we start our agenda uh, uh, this afternoon or tonight on um, general business, with the first being, uh, Stacy, has the meeting been properly posted? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, now is uh, the time for public comment uh, to our committee this evening. Uh, Stacy, we have one person. There's a second person in the hall filling out the form. I'll bring it right to you. That sounds good. Um, and I'm just going to make a few comments prior to. Um, we are now in the section of our meeting where there is an opportunity for individuals to speak. As has been past practice, each individual will be limited to three minutes to speak in order for us to hear from our community. Uh, Mr. Cuomo will signal at the two and a half minute mark in order for you to wrap up your comments. We expect all speakers to honor our time limit, to refrain from using any inappropriate language in any manner, and be respectful in their comments. Speakers who do not meet these expectations will be prohibited from speaking at future Board of Education meetings. We also expect the audience to be respectful of the speaker and of the Board of Education and refrain from responding with verbal comments or other behavior that will distract from our meeting. Um, so we have two speakers this evening. Um, first we have Samuel D'Amico. So Samuel, if you would uh, please come up, please, and welcome. Uh, good evening, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity uh, to speak tonight. Uh, I would like to start off by saying a few words about the ethics and conduct of some of the board members in recent weeks. Uh, numerous school board members have been consistently and proactively ignoring their constituents, uh, specifically students, staff members, uh, and concerned families, people who do not agree with some of the actions uh, that some of you have taken. Uh, to simplify, some of you here are ignoring constituents that disagree with you. Uh, running for any kind of office is political, uh, but once you are on the Board of Education, your job is to listen to every single constituent in the school district, not just ones who voted for you and agree with you. Your job is to listen to everyone. And frankly, that is not the reality we are seeing today. Uh, some school board members that are here and are not here, uh, physically, Anthony Zenobia, Kelly Piasek, Karen Reinjik, Patrick McCaffrey and Joseph Como have a long list of ignored constituents, including myself. Uh, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize other members who have not taken that road, like Greg Dietz, uh, Bill Baumgart, and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Roddy, who do listen to their constituents and take a proactive measure to listen to the people in this district, unlike other members here. Uh, this is not about one issue, one vote, or one stance, because I'm not here to talk about that. This is about you doing your job and listening to all people, whether or not they agree with you. Thank you for your time, and I hope the school board members I previously mentioned uh, start doing their job. Thank you. Samuel? Next this evening, we have uh, Mitzi Keetel. Mitzi, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, Keetel. Okay. Welcome, Mitzi. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I want to speak to you and advocate for evaluating curriculum through a racially sensitive lens. This does not mean wiping out what we currently have, or as some have termed it, cancel culture. It does mean peeling back the onion for a more touristic understanding of our rich history. You may have seen on the news this week, as we honored all veterans, deeper stories of people of color who fought, died, but were denied benefits because of their race. You may also be familiar with the commemoration of the Tulsa Massacre of 1921. People died and lost generational wealth due to racial hatred. Why does this matter? Because we are all living through the after effects. 
Many of us have a mental void when it comes to understanding why certain groups fear police presence or what the difficulty is in accumulating property wealth. Many of us have not had to worry if we wouldn't get an interview because of the sound of our name or our address. These are just tips of an iceberg. Last month, two moms spoke about wrenching experiences their children had in lessons related to bias and white supremacy. No matter how well-intentioned, no child should walk into a classroom with trepidation or out of one distraught. These topics do need addressing, but please give your teachers enough time and resources to build the background skills it need, they need for this new and sometimes unsettling material. There should be no connection to political party. Enlist trusted voices like the Hispanic Collaborative Network. We have a Waukesha County NAACP the United Way has had a tremendous uh, racial equity challenge going on all summer. Spend the time and energy to respond to concerns and get parents and the community on board now in order to have the best outcomes in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi. Anyone else have this evening that wants to address the committee? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we're going to move on um, under general business. Uh, the last item under general business this evening. We have a bright lights presentation uh, from Whittier Elementary School. They're going to be telling us about their partnership with Carroll University. So I want to welcome uh, their principal, Brandy Hart, and she will introduce uh, our other guests tonight, and we look forward to your presentation. So uh, turn it over to Brandy. Hi everyone, my name is Brandi Hart. I am the principal at Whittier Elementary School. Thank you for having us here today for Bright Lights. Um, I have brought some students that will be doing our Bright Lights presentation. Um, and girls, you are ready to begin. Good evening, Teaching and Learning Committee. My name is Samantha Appleton. I'm Sonala Patterson. I'm Anabe Aguilar. We are fifth graders at Whittier, and we are here to brag to you about our great experience working with Carroll University this year. Whittier fifth graders partnered with Dr. White's college course called Unequal Childhoods to Equitable Childhoods, Education Past, Present, and Future. This course was offered to education majors, business and finance majors, criminal justice majors, and more. COVID-19 mitigations almost disconnected us and our partnership this year, but our school and Cary University professor, Dr. White, worked together to do whatever it took to make it work. February, Dr. White's class at, at Carroll began a weekly virtual meeting with us fifth graders. Our first meeting we talked about are All About Me posters. Us fifth graders and the college students. This helped us to start forming friendships. This picture shows my friend Yvette on our class meeting. We love this project. Here are some examples of the All About Me posters. We shared our goals, favorites, and learned about our similarities and differences. This was the best way to talk to a new person without feeling too nervous. Relationships matter to us and to everyone. This screen shows you a few, few examples of the slides we shared when we first met. During their class at Carroll University, the college students learned all about Whittier. They had an opportunity to connect their learning by talking with us kids, interviewing our principal, our social workers, some of our teachers, and our care workers too. These different meetings help us connect their learning by learning from a different person connected in the school. Us kids are probably their favorite. Distance didn't stop us from connecting, and that's a positive we've been able to take away from this school year. 
me learn things from them, like advice about middle school and getting to college. But they learned from us too. They learned about what it's like to be f a fifth grader. They learned about our Whittier com community in school and at home. They learned what they need to do to be great educators, first responders, and overall good citizens that care about everyone in their community. One of the things we accomplished together was a way to give back to our school. We're fifth graders and next year we won't be at Whittier. We are one of the best fifth grade classes and one is wanted to start a tradition of leaving something behind, something that could help other kids. Like my brothers and sisters that will still be in Whittier even though I'll be in middle school. Our college partners help us raise money for the buddy bank that will be placed in our playgrounds. Picture of what it will look like. It's arriving to us next week and our custodians will help us make sure it's in a great spot. A buddy bench is a place for a kid to sit down to sh show other kids that they need a friend. It's an easy way to say that you're kind of feeling lonely without having to say anything at all. We all have had days when this could have helped us out at recess. COVID having less of an impact on our recess next year, all of the kids at Whittier will be able to use it without any problems. That was a summary of our partnership with Carol this year. I'm sure, sure it will expand once the university and district have less safety restrictions, but we wanted to come here today to let you know the community of Carroll University and, and Whittier Elementary School made it work this year, even though it looked a little bit different. Of our school, Carol is our school too. Support to our school is appreciated. Thank you for having us here to represent the rest of our classmates. Do you guys have any questions for us? Questions or comments? Mr. Como. Yeah, well, thank you for that presentation. You guys did a, an excellent job. And I was wondering if you could tell me, um, how did you come up with the idea um, of what to give back to the community? How, how did that come about? Um, so my college buddy uh, talked to me about something that we could give back to Whittier and I really was kind of clueless um, but then I thought of a buddy bench and my college buddy liked it and some other fifth graders of mine also thought of that and so I think that it just like came together and so everyone agreed that it was a great idea. I also agree. <laughs> I agree too, and um, I I liked it too because I like the idea too because um, it would help other students like if they're lonely if they don't have anybody to spend time with and my um, and my college buddy um, she 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 helped with the idea and she told me a little bit about it. Well, how how did you like working with college students? Um, for me, it was kind of interesting because, I mean, I'm only a fifth grader, and so I didn't really know that much about college. Um, but, I mean, now I know some of the things that they do there or the assignments that they have, and so it was just like a learning experience for me. Well, for me, it was, like, exciting, and they get to tell us more about them, and they get to know more about us. Fun because I got to know about my Carol buddy, and I got to like kind of experience what has been happening in um, college. So, what did you learn about giving back to your community? Um, we learned that I mean it's important to do it because, um, like you know, we're fifth graders, and so um, we want to kind of have the memory of our school and that um, that we did something to help other kids. So like we can feel good about that and other kids can thank us for that. <laughs> I agree as well. <laughs> but it's a pretty good feeling when you give to someone else, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You know, it's, it's actually probably one of the best feelings you experience as a human being it's when you give to someone else or you serve someone else and you can be any age and serve and help others, right? That's, I'm sure that's one of the things that you learned. You said, uh -huh. even though you're a fifth grader, well, but you're a person in this world 
and you can care for others at any time. So I, I appreciate I appreciate your answers, Mr. Baumgart. Uh, I'm not sure, Brandy. You, you might want to answer this question, or maybe they can. I, I missed at the beginning. Are all of the the Carol kids that are joining with our kids? Are they all in the education? Teach going to be teachers, or is it a mixture? Um, there were education majors, there were criminal justice majors, um, business and finance majors, and more things like that. Great, because I think there's another element to this. I mean, I, I heard how you guys benefited from it, and that's great. But it's also important that the, the, the students that were there from Carroll are benefiting, learning how to work with, cooperate with, deal with, let's be honest about it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fifth graders. I mean, uh, so you've helped them as well as they've helped you, and I think that's important. Plus the fact that they aren't all going to be teachers, that, that's okay because I think you said criminal justice, and, uh, you know, they're going to be dealing with people as part of their life. Uh, business and finance, sometimes they don't get as close to people as maybe they should, <laughs> but I happen to know that. But uh, again, as, as Mr. Como said, thank you for sharing what could become a very important role, not just in Whittier, but other schools don't, don't have maybe a, that much going with them. And I know that we've used a lot of uh, cooperation with the Carroll kids in our AVID programs as well. So uh, it's, it's just, it's a wonder that we have them right here and they are so willing to help and, and, and that you have benefited from it and shared with them. And that's important. It's a, it's a two-way thing. Thank you. Mr. Como. Is, is Dr. White here tonight? Wait, what is that? Is Dr. White here tonight? Okay. Um, no, she is not. Now, and, and, and this might be for you, Ms. Hart, um, if you don't mind. So... Um, <coughs> I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question, but how, how long has Dr. White been doing these kinds of things? This is the first class that she's done um, with her syllabus written entirely about communicating with and collaborating with a school. Um, so this is a new course that she just started teaching this last semester. Her and I had collaborated before um, when we were talking about the possibility of a community school. And so when she started developing this course in mind, she knew that we were gonna try something. Um, and so I'm hoping that this grows into something more. And, and there have been wonderful relationships that we've had with Carol, as you had mentioned, Mr. Bumgard, over the years in many programs. I even know when my kids were back in elementary school many moons ago, I don't know if it's the same doctor, white or not, but um, there, 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 there were some excellent programs, um, and it was really more on the teacher, uh, the teaching opportunities that the um, students at Carol who were learning how to be elementary uh, ed teachers that, but um, we've had a long tradition with Carolyn. Um, just please pass on to Dr. White. Uh, thank you from us Will and uh, appreciate that. Dr. Piazic. So as fifth graders, that transition to middle school is a pretty big deal and working with your college buddies, I'm just curious, have you talked about what you're looking forward to in middle school or some of your thoughts about classes? Um, yes, with my college buddy, we talked about uh, all my like interests or hobbies, and um, and if I was nervous or excited about middle school. And every time I answered that, um, I was a little bit of both. Like I'm nervous just because it's a new environment, but I'm also excited because it's like a new start of schooling and just new friends and just like everything. Um. With my college buddy, we talked about how it wasn't going to be the same, that much the same as fifth grade. You'll see different people, different classes, and some people, they'll help you how to get around, like how to like go to class or like which teachers you can go to when you need help. I care buddy, we talked about like her experience in middle school and how hard it was and like um, learning new things. Anyone else? Ms. Roddy. Yes, thank you. Thank you ladies for that um, presentation. 
um, my other colleagues asked the questions that I had written down for you, but um, I had made some notes and you shared with us a couple of things that you learned through this experience. You mentioned that relationships matter and that the distance um, in your class experience didn't stop you. Um, the relationships matter, you're absolutely correct. Not only getting to know the, um, your Carol buddies as students, but as individuals. And when we learn you know, the, um, each other as individuals, it, it helps us um, as we go forward. And the distance didn't stop you. Uh, I'm sure you being in, at Whittier and um, all of the, the just differences that we had this year versus your you know, first through fourth grade years, um, you got to see how that looked at a college level and what those things were like and, and how um, the two different classrooms works together to, to overcome those and you still, sounds like you got a lot out of it. So um, I love hearing what, what you learned and experienced uh, through that relationship. So uh, I too please send our thanks to, to Dr. White and her class. Thank you. Anything else? I want to thank uh, the three students that uh, were here tonight uh, for Bright Lights. Uh, first of all, your presentation was awesome. Um, I could tell you were prepared. Um, you're not at all nervous <laughs> and just very relaxed. Yes, can't see <laughs> and if this is how you present yourself in fifth grade, um, good things are going to be happening as you move through. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one, were there only the three of you involved in this project or were there other students at Whittier? It was um, all of the fifth grade class, so um, both Mr. Hurtis's class and Ms. Lenz's class. Um, so it was just everyone, but we're the three people that are representing all of okay. it. So make sure you um, extend our thanks to the rest of them. So how many students would that be in total? And did you get any feedback from the college students as to what they picked up from this experience of working with fifth grade um, students? Uh, I think that my college buddy said that right fifth grade year and that it was better than her fifth grade year. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think that she really enjoyed it. Good. <laughs> Must be having fun in all these things. She wanted me to have a good time with her. My hero buddy had um, a lot of fun because, um, like the last time we got to um, see our Carol buddies, she gave me like this paper that showed her like experience in middle school, and um, she said that she had a lot, a lot of fun um, um, getting to know me. And then do any of you um, look, are any of you anticipating the friendship with your Carol uh, student to continue or will it, um, will it end, which is okay, but if it well, would continue, if you'd share that. Um, well, like for us, since we're going into middle school, I'm pretty sure that um, the relationship will end, sadly. But um, I hope that Carol kind of moves on with uh, Whittier, and so maybe the next fifth grade class or maybe even the next fourth grade class could do the same thing that we did. Awesome. I mean, you've started something brand new here. I mean, just think how exciting that is. I mean, I'm excited <laughs> for you. I mean, to start something at the ground level that's the best place to be, and then things will only continue to get better, but you were the first ones who um, began such a partnership with uh, Carol in this format. Um, so I just want to thank you for being here tonight, doing a great job of uh, presenting, and also thank your principal for being open to uh, Carol College and that collaboration that she has with Carol. Um, without what she's doing behind the scenes, you wouldn't be here tonight. So um, sometime between uh, but before you leave here and tomorrow morning, make sure you thank her too, okay? Okay. Have a great night and thank you so much thank for you. your presentation.
We're moving into our action items uh, for this evening. Um, we have one action item, approval of the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting minutes from our May 4th, 2021 meeting. I'll move approval, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Cuomo. Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Baumgard. Any comments, uh, questions, discussion on our minutes, or any changes, revisions? Okay, seeing none. All in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes Stacy 5 0. Moving along to our discussion information items this evening, we have Whittier Elementary School back uh, to uh, talk about the Achievement Gap Reduction Grant. Um, this grant requires an update uh, to the Board of Education two times a year, as well as an opportunity for our committee members here this evening to ask questions and or make uh, comments as uh, they would like. So um, welcome to um, our Woodier team. We also have Melissa Yao here, um, Director of uh, Elementary Instruction, and uh, we wanna welcome her as well. So uh, we'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm back. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm here to present um, on our AGR data. Um, these are the things that I'm gonna be going through tonight. What is the AGR grant? What is the identified strategy in use? I'm gonna give you an update on our relationship data that I gave an update of in February when I was here last. I'll give you map data, um, growth and achievement, and I'll give you action steps for our next school year. So what is the AGR grant? It is a program, Achievement Gap Reduction is the name, and it was established in 1516 after the SAGE grant went away, um, allowing for small class sizes. The AGR um, grant allows for a one or a mixture of three determined strategies, tutoring or intervention, small class sizes, meaning 18 or less students in a classroom in kindergarten through third, or um, a coach, an instructional coach for teachers. Um, the AGR grant requires a board presentation twice a year to establish both how the grant is being utilized as well as um, the data that is going along with the year. Um, I presented to you in February and I'm back now in June and I'll be back again next year. The current strategy that we are using is the small class sizes. Again, 18 or less students in classrooms in kindergarten through third grade. We chose this because it allowed teachers the ability to um, instruct tier one universal, um, universal instruction as well as small groups in their classrooms. Tier two and three, those are interventions um, three to five times per week. Build up and scaffold those skills that students need differentiate varying needs and learning styles in the classroom, but also to provide more one-on-one -on -one continual checks, both academically and um, social emotionally as needed. I gave you an update last time I was here on relationship data. I had just finished collecting some data around student relationships in the school when I was here last. Um, we still believe that no significant learning will occur without significant relationships. Um, why did we dive into that? We dove into that because at the end of the school year in 2020, we learned that only 25% of all students felt respected for differences. That was all students and it was lower for black and Hispanic students. Um, we, that indicated to us as educators, we needed to do a much better job um, with student to adult relationships, with student to student relationships. Um, and teaching around those differences, um, tolerance, acceptance, kindness, respect, all of those things were um, directly targeted this school year. Um, we monitored that data um, with student perception surveys to all second through fifth grade students every single month. So we did not wait until the end of the school year to see like how are things going. Um, this is just a glimpse of what our month to month progress monitoring looked like. Um, I'm not gonna go over it, but I want you to know that we took it very seriously. All the data um, that we collected was then distributed to each different grade level and the teachers were able to have those conversations with their classrooms and figure out what we were missing so that we were getting direct feedback from our students to grow this. 
Um, at the top, you can see different characteristics that we taught um, that went along with our second step social and emotional curriculum. And then this is our spring to spring data. You can see the increase in our spring 2021 data, it's at the top, in comparison with just one year with some explicit focus on relationship building and some direct instruction around social emotional learning, we were able to increase from 40, no, sorry, from 25% to 71% all students, from 41% to 67% white students, 17 to 60 of our black students, and then 13 to 83% of our Hispanic students that said agree or strongly agree to students respecting others who are different. Um, to us, this was great growth in one year, um, but we still want it to be higher than this. Um, we'll continue to grow on this goal as we move into next year. But our focus in all of this um, is knowing that our kids, once accepted in their learning environments for who they are, will be able to put more of their focus on their academics. Um, and with that, I'm going to move into academic data, but I'm going to pause in case anyone has any questions on social emotional growth. Thank you. This is very exciting to see this progress. As part of the uh, information, when you're talking about the respect from others, uh, I forgot all of those things here. Okay. Is that student to student, student to staff, or both? It's in this specific question, it is students respect others who are different. So it's students saying that other students respect. There's a question also that says, I respect differences and we're off the charts. But when they have to give some <laughs> feedback around does everyone, um, we're a little lower. And this is the one we're looking at specifically. Thank you, mm -hmm. it helps. Dr. Piazic. I do have a question just, um, just because we went kind of quickly through the graph you had before, it sure. looked like students were moving from the category of maybe agree to strongly agree, because some of those were going down, but I'm, I'm assuming some of those lines that are going down are because the strongly agree is going up. Yes. It's not a negative trend that you're seeing there on any of those. No, I mean, there were, um, when you add up the agree and strongly agree, there were definite months where we didn't see quite as much um, growth. For example, the month we were teaching about tolerance, um, we, it, w it went down a little bit um, because we were actively talking about it. And what does that really mean? Or acceptance, um, we weren't quite as high because kids were actively learning about it. Um, so I think like different months, um, growth mindset, um, we were skyrocketed. So I do think it went along with the different um, second step skills that we were talking about in the classrooms too. I, li I really like too the way you uh, focused um, on like one of those concepts or words for a given month because a lot of times you'll ask people questions about things and they don't have a complete understanding of what it was but if you've had a month of activities and discussion and reflection uh, you really get that concept and so that I think would tell me when the students evaluated themselves and their relationships with others that they had that understanding which was uh, helpful in getting a true reflection of uh, their thoughts. So thank you. Mr. Cuomo. So by focusing on relationships, I, I, I feel that that helps mold the culture of Whittier. Have you seen changes in the culture as the years progressed? Yes, I would say I don't have a ton to compare to, but from last year to this year, the feel is different um, within our hallways, within our classrooms, um, teacher to teacher, student to student, teacher to student. I think that um, the team mentality of our, of our um, team Whittier, kids, students, everybody that's there, I feel like it is stronger this year. Um, I, you know, asked specific people that were there last year from this year, like, what do you think? Like, did it feel different? to you because I'm here every day um, and other people have commented as well that um, it, it does feel different so I'm going to keep that feel of making sure that we are a team um, students and teachers teachers and teachers that we're all working together um, to have that collective efficacy of we're growing students social emotionally and academically together I, I appreciate that Brandy I, you know without building strong relationships with one, one another I don't care if it's Elementary school, a business, your family. I mean, relationships are at, at, at the core. So I, I'm glad that there's been 
a strong influence on the culture o over this year and a positive one. Thank you for sharing that. I continue? Yes, okay. All right, so I am going to move right into um, academic data. Our first group that I'm going to share is our kindergarten and first grade readers. <clears throat> So for our kindergarten and first grade readers, the measurement that we use is different than second through fifth. Um, we do not use map data for readers in kinder and first, we use running records. So just know that. Um, our end of the year goal is we would hope that all of our readers would be 50% or more on grade level. You can see that um, we did not um, meet our goal in either grade level. Um, this school year. I want to point out um, that all students currently in our face-to-face -face model um, are included in this data, no matter what month they came back to school with us, um, because I think that's very important. Like We worked hard to work with families where they were, and anytime they were ready to come back, we took every single student back. Um, so with that, I'd like to show you some growth that we did make um, with our running record data. This is kindergarten. The lighter blue represents, oh, it should not say winter, it should say fall, sorry about that, um, represents fall of where they come in. A zero is typical for a kindergarten reader to come in. Our goal is to grow them a level to a level running record level five or more. The reason I point this out is because in first grade, this is, this is where our readers looked coming to us in the fall. You can see we had a greater than typical number of students that started first grade at a level zero or one. Knowing this, we made great gains um, with our first grade readers. Um, we have a ways to go. And um, I, I do want to point out some specific examples, though, because I think that data is much more than a number. There's a child behind those. And I think um, knowing that, it, it kind of makes you know that our teachers are working very hard. Um, to make these gains. One of my threes that's represented here in the fall grew all the way to a level 20 in one year. Um, one of those ones you see as grew to a level 19, a zero to a 13, a zero to an 18. Those are just a couple of examples of some growth that we're very, very proud of um, at Whittier with our first grade um, readers. I'm gonna keep going into second through third, second and third grade, um, and this is map data. The map test is used to measure our end of the year goal is that 50% of the grade level is at or above the 50th percentile. Um, you can see that by the spring data, we did not meet this in either of those grade levels for achievement. Um, I am gonna show you growth as well because we did have 57% of our second graders and 53% of our third graders meet their MAP growth goal. And I think that's important um, because when you look at a child that comes into the school year, like student A in second grade, who started at the eighth percentile and is now into the year on a 38th percentile, she did not make the chart, but she grew so much and we're so proud of her and we shared that with her family. Um, and there's so many other examples, like the boy who started at the fifth percentile that's now at the 29th percentile as a reader. Those are very, very great growth goals, and I think it's important to share those. In third grade, I'm going to share two examples. One girl who came in hating reading at the 13th percentile and is leaving third grade in the 48th percentile, just almost hitting that end of the year growth um, goal at 50% at the 50th percentile, or the boy who came in um, not really knowing what he could do because his attendance wasn't really great, um, but 17th percentile to the 45th. And those are the things that I feel like I have to show you growth as well as achievement because there's a lot of hard work going on and we still have a long ways to go. Um, yes, sir. As I look at that, I guess my question is turnover. You've got 24 kids. Is it always the same 24 kids? Now, in second grade, we were very lucky to hang on to most of our kids from the beginning to the end. There were a couple of students that went 
virtual face-to-face, -face, virtual face-to-face -face okay. because there was some uneasiness and we allowed that to happen. But in second grade, it was really our only grade level where we didn't have a ton of movement. So if you go back to those um, kinder ones, we started the year with 18 first graders and ended the year with 27 first graders. Those were all from kids that were coming back from virtual learning to face-to-face. -face. Um, and each grade level kind of had a different scenario, but second grade was the one where we were kind of lucky and kept the same cohort. Um, but honestly, um, Mr. Baumgart, no matter what kid comes to the door, we're going to accept them with open arms no matter where they are. No, but I was wondering if it had an impact. And we're at 6 of 24, 6 of 24. Is it the same 6 of 24? About the same 24. I mean, I think there's maybe one or two students that moved out that replaced with different students, but it's about the same cohort. That's all I was trying yeah. to do, find out whether we've got a real it is no cohesive group or not and there is some changing going on yes. and we have to understand that yes it's a Whittier has a transient population um, not as much this year as last year that's all I have to compare it to um, we're looking at previous data um, but um, yes I think that our data will be more transient as we move on to the future too question answered thank you no problem Brandy do you do running records on um, kids in uh, second through fifth grade we do you have data on that to compare it to map data at all? I did not prepare that. I mean, I have it. We have an active data wall that I could pull it from. I can send it to all of you just so you have a uh, comparison. Um, we often do see more growth in a running record than we do on a map test. I mean, there are several reasons why. Your running record is sitting right next to your teacher, and you want to impress that teacher so much that you're different than you are on a test where you're behind a screen clicking away. I mean, so... I feel like, you know, they're two different data points and we use them both, um, but for a standardized score of a um, test that's compared nationwide, I do think we do need to use MAP also, but I can share running records as well if that would be helpful. I know what kids do on the MAP test. I mean, especially, uh, you know, well, any grade level actually. If the um, content in front of them is too difficult, they're, they're not going to even try. I mean, just like if something's super challenging to me, uh, or they're not going to try as hard. Let's say not even try. I don't want to say that, but not as hard because it's overwhelming and they're just guessing. Um, so I guess looking at more than one data point. Um, So um, just to go along with that, we could look at running records and MAP um, for the older grades. We could also look at PALS data as well as running record in the lower grades levels, if that would help. Um, as teachers, you know, we do use more than one data point as well. So that, that I could do that and bring that next time so that we see different data as well. Like the exposure to MAP because that is, you know, what the COVID exam is all about. Right. If you don't have any experience with that and don't have strategies to help them move through of assessments um, that's not good either so maybe a balance is um, definitely I have a time for a question <laughs> I do have a question um, and I'm, I'm trying to recall what year was my, my recollection is that from first grade to second grade there's there's a pretty big change in how the map test is actually delivered and um, do you attribute any of these outcomes to that. Microphone. We do see a drop in um, second grade having lower scores because of the format of the test. Um, that's one of the reasons why we currently in kinder and first grade are using PALS in running records versus MAP because there was such a discrepancy. The um, MAP assessment at kindergarten and um, first grade uses a lot more um, pictures. It also verbally um, asks the questions for students. It's also adaptive, so it does you know, continue to rise in the way that the questions are, are asked um, for students, but um, you do see a difference for that. And for some students in second grade too, that's the first time that they have an assessment like that, but they will continue as of now into the foreseen future to continue to um, have assessments that ask them that, and we want to make sure that they are prepared for that. Okay, we're going to move into math. 
in math, for math, we do use um, the map data for all grades, kindergarten through third. So they're all here together. Um, you can see that kindergarten has exceeded our end of the year um, goal and um, both first and second were one student away from hitting our end of the year goal um, and third grade did not meet that goal. I'm going to show growth again um, so that you can see the grade levels that did not meet the end of the year goal still did grow. 65% in first grade met their MAP growth for end of the year, 83% of our second graders and 43% of our third graders um, did meet the growth goal for the end of the year. Um, we know we have a lot of work, which moves us into our action steps for next year. I'm very, very proud of my team. Um, I know that we have a lot of work to go and I know that um, together we will do it. Um, and I, I just wanna say that because I'm proud of my people and I think they're working really hard. Um, we have a lot of work to do, so I recognize that. Um, we see that small classes, small class sizes alone um, is not impacting the data as positively as we need. Therefore, we will be switching our strategy um, for a bit next school year. We're going to mix um, looking at research on schools that have the AGR data, um, sorry, AGR grant. The ones that are most successful were doing a lot more than just small class sizes. Um, they were doing a mixture of those three strategies, some intervention, some coaching, some small class sizes. Um, so we are going to try to do that um, and um, uh, have an AGR coach and intervention teacher supporting K-1. Um, that coach will work closely with kindergarten and first grade teachers, our district coaches, and help us directly impact student learning in those, class in those classrooms. We'll still be focused on professional development um, in the classroom with the teachers, as well as um, outside of the classroom in, in our professional development learning model that we have. Um, the high amount of teacher and student feedback um, is why we've chosen this route um, to make sure that our classrooms are as focused as possible with targeted purposeful small groups. Oops, sorry, I should have clicked that. Um, we're continuing professional development in reading and math um, that will look Coaching, second through fifth grade, will have um, the impact of our district coaches. Kindergarten and first grade will have the impact of our AGR coach. Our AGR coach will be able to teach intervention groups as well, targeted tutoring, and help in really however those classrooms need it. Um, our focus is going to be on purposeful, targeted small groups so that we know a student's goal um, in reading and we are that's what we're pushing next year as one of our goals. Um, and then also, just so you know, we are still going to be focusing some PD um, around relationships um, and some social emotional needs of our students. And that is our plan um, for moving into next year um, for our the use of our EGR grant. Show my sweet girls again, and what questions would you guys have um, moving in? Mr. Como. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, Brandy, do you have any sort of communication with other school principals who also have received this grant um, so that you have some dynamics going on and ch exchange of ideas? So um, through MPS, there are quite a few schools that have the AGR grant. Um, they tried something new this year and put together um, AGR focus groups with other principals. Some of, them, some of them were attended by coaches and not the principal. Um, there were three different meetings this school year. I went to the first one and I did not make the next two um, because there was just so much happening. Um, I couldn't make it work, but um, I will continue to do that next year. Um, there are articles that are released that you can see which schools, it's very public knowledge about how schools are doing. Um, and you can see, you can read that um, the schools that are having the success are mixing the strategies. Um, for my knowledge, um, we've only tried small class sizes at Whittier, and so it is time to try something um, additional um, to see what we're missing, because it is not that we don't have hardworking staff. It is not that we don't have students that can't learn. Um, so I, I think just switching our focus um, will help our students and our staff. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Baumgart. Actually, my question was buried in there, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, actually, 
uh, maybe I do have an add to that. Go ahead. And it might be for Jody Moore. So this is the only school in Waukesha School District that's operating under this. Have we looked into it for any other situations? Or I mean, we've made progress at, at Whittier. Are we looking further or not? We have not looked further, I guess, since I've been here. I will say um, sort of comparable in terms of federal funding are some of our ESSA-identified schools upon which um, we have a state identification. We are granted um, federal dollars in order to improve at that school. So we have right now, I think, four or five schools um, that are operating with an ESSA funding status that okay. would be comparable outcomes as the Achievement Gap Reduction Grant. Thank you, I think that answers my question. And prior prior history, so um, SAGE, when we had the SAGE funding, yes. um, Saratoga, when it was an elementary school, received um, SAGE funding and White Rock. And when White Rock closed, that did not go to another school. And then the SAGE funding followed over from Whittier when it transitioned um, to a STEM school, transitioned over to, to Whittier, and then eventually, then SAGE went away and AGR came, came in. Um, so prior when SAGE was at um, Whittier, there was a time of the combination between um, some money used for intervention and small group then. But since it's been AGR and at Whittier, it's only been small class size. Thank you for that history, because I think that helped me get. I'm a little sad that I can now share history, um, <laughs> but it's OK. Give me a break, will you? <laughs> <laughs> That's where you started is at Whittier, right? Is that no, I started correct? at Saratoga and Oh, Green OK, Academy. OK. I thought you spent some time at Whittier. I did. Okay. That was just in as you gained more experience, you were at Whittier. That's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Anything else? I really like the direction that you're going with um, the small group instruction. And I think through that, um, you'll be able to um, share data with students as well so that they can keep track of um, their goals and their progress. Um, I know in anything I'm involved in, if I'm getting feedback and um, seeing where I am with the goal and how much more I have to do or what I shouldn't do um, to uh, reach that goal, it uh, is very impressive and usually the results turn out just fine. Um, I was wanting to know, are there anything uh, would anything special that you're doing to um, incorporate uh, the support from parents as well in um, trying to improve achievement, especially in the areas of reading and math? So the last two years, um, we have been trying very hard to make sure parents are purposely included both academically, social, emotionally, and just involved in the community. Like the whole team feel that I keep trying to, you know, push is families as well. Um, we have incorporated um, Class Dojo with all classrooms, the whole school. So we're constantly like um, celebrating with shout outs, giving pictures and videos of all the great things that are happening, especially right now since parents really aren't in the building. Um, we're making sure that they know what's happening. Um, our conferences um, were twice a year um, with very purposeful, like everyone used the exact same forms. We were very honest with families. Your child is performing below level, your child is at level, your child is um, above level, and these are the things that you can help us do to support so that we're all on the same page. Um, and then next year we continue to um, grow that. We have a family engagement committee that is committed to moving our support to families, not just you have to come to us, but hey, we're gonna come to you too. And we have um, some summer events that are already planned that um, we're gonna go out to, to community parks and just um, make sure that the relationship building continues even though school's not in session. Go ahead, Ms. Bunker. Add, add something to that. Um, and I know from a, another perspective, a friend of mine who's very active through church work, and I'm not sure if it's St. Luke's, uh, a tremendous amount of support and association with our kids and, and the parents through, the, through uh, the, that church. 
I have a couple of churches that support um, Whittier, both um, in, you know, with events and um, monetary, making sure kids have food. Um, there's just a lot of really amazing things um, around and supporting um, the community of Whittier. Thank you. The community is very strong towards you, your school, and it's been helpful. Anything else from the committee? Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to you coming back next year and hearing about uh, how the new implementation plan will be working. And um, we appreciate uh, your time tonight. Thank you so much for the update. Thank you. Next this evening, um, under discussion information items, we have. Uh, a report and update on school-based mental health. We have Luke Pinion here this evening, our Director of Student Services, and we also have Laura Sharon, Family Service Director of Program and Clinical Services from Family Service. So uh, I'll turn it over to Luke and Laura, and uh, welcome to our committee meeting tonight. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you, Mr. Dietz. Um, good to see every, every board member this evening. I'm Luke Pinion, Director of Student Services, and I'll let Laura introduce herself as well. Hello, oh, as you heard, I'm Laura Sharon. I'm the Director of Programs and Clinical Services at Family Service. So although there are a lot of intersections for school-based mental health and all the great work that we do to support our students' mental wellness, tonight I really wanted to focus the conversation in the update around PATH. So it's an acronym that's specific to the School District of Waukesha School-Based Mental Health Services that stands for Providing Access to Healing. Specifically, this is our partnership with Family Service and um, our placement of licensed psych psychotherapists and community mental health providers throughout all of our schools in Waukesha. Go ahead. So I probably don't need to go into the why too much with this group or with anyone in 2021, but we all know um, the need for mental health services and support is high uh, across the country. Specifically for school-based mental health services, there are many purposes behind this. One is um, just the rising need uh, that we see in our students, um, as well as barriers that are faced to seeking traditional psychotherapy outside of the school setting. Um, a lot of those barriers prevent families and students from getting the treatment and access that they need for their unmet needs. Uh, there's also an issue of just capacity, right? We have school psychologists, sc student services, social workers, counselors. Um, they don't really have the capacity to do the level of work that our psychotherapists do um, in our schools. And then there's also the DPI school mental health framework that has been around for several years now, and we are in a alignment with one of the models that they recommend for school-based services. Um, so there's lots of needs. We also know um, statistics out of the National Alliance of Mental Illness as well as the CDC do continue replicating this figure of one in five students having a diagnosable mental health disorder. You'll also see ranges around 70-80% that go untreated for those types of disorders. So we know the need is high and we know it's the right work to be doing. It's my favorite work in my role here. It's my passion, uh, former school psychologist, so this really is true to the heart of, of the best work that, that uh, isn't involved in my role. So go ahead. Uh, I wanted Laura to speak a little bit just about family services. They are a longstanding partner for this. So she'll give a little bit of background about their agency. Well, thank you. So it's not such a fun joke for us that family service has been the best kept secret in Waukesha County for many years. We're trying to change that. But uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak and, and the champion that Luke has been for advancing uh, mental health services in the school district of Waukesha. Family Service is a private, not-for-profit agency that has been in Waukesha County for 54 years. We were established in 1964. And the purpose of our organization has always been to address service gaps right here locally in Waukesha County and to, to develop programs to address unmet needs. So you can see that this school-based counseling program is one of those types of programs. Our mental health counseling services are really our our largest offering to the community, but just so you have some idea of who we are other than that, I wanted to also mention that we have the Center for Prevention of Family Violence that provides offender treatment for domestic violence offenders and also provides family violence prevention, anger management services, and things like that. We also offer the 
Waukesha County's only child advocacy center, the CARE Center, that is located in the Big Yellow House. It aids in child abuse crime prosecution by providing forensic interviews and forensic medical exams to alleged victims of child abuse. But back to our mental health counseling program. We have a little more than 30 therapists that are employed in that program. Uh, last year, we served about 1,300 people through 11,375 counseling sessions. 43% of those, or 4,850, were services to students in schools in Waukesha County. So we have a presence in 54 different schools within seven school districts, most of which are in Waukesha County. One is right over the border. But the school district of Waukesha has, was our first school-based community partner since 2009 and today remains our most valued community partner for providing school mental health services. Um, school District of Waukesha is the most respected district in Waukesha County, as well as the largest. But as I said before, I have found the Waukesha School District to be very, very supportive and a completely invested partner in this effort, which has been uh, just delightful. Um, last year, through our school-based mental health counseling program, we served 98 students, and 46 of these students are going to remain in services over the summer, even when school is out, which to me really speaks to the family and the student's investment in, in this work. The only other thing I wanted to mention to you about family services as a nonprofit agency, we have a very lean budget. We rely on program service fees that come through insurance companies or private payments from individuals, grants, contracts, and we do a great deal of fund development. So that's who we are, and I'll turn this back to Luke. Thank you, Laura, and feel free to interrupt us at any time if you have any questions, though we will reserve a little bit of time at the end as well. Um, just to give you a bit of history, Laura went over this already. Uh, they've been, PATH has been standing for 10 years going into next year here in the school district of Waukesha, which was well ahead of its time 10 years ago. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find any district in Wisconsin and very few across the country that were doing this at that time. It has become much more of a national trend and local as well. Um, we bought up, brought Whittier on board 10 years ago, followed by Horning in the 14-15 school year. Again, under that insurance billable model. Uh, it does start with a very limited number of seats at each school, depending on how many therapists. Are they there one day a week versus two days and such? Um, you know, they can only see so many students where they're developing treatment plans, treatment goals, seeing students weekly for that therapy, and updating accordingly. Um, of course, they fall under the umbrella of HIPAA, which we follow those uh, legal confidential guidelines and requirements. And then we, as a school, of course, fall under FERPA. And then we started supplementing that billable time with grants in 2017 and 18 to get a little bit of further reach of that therapist beyond just that face-to-face -face therapy with students, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this further illustrates uh, my four years, at least, here working with PATH again. Um, my, my first year in 1718, we were just bringing Banting on as a third school for this program, at which time the United Way had approached um, us to see about possible expansion under grant funding. So we brought South Hadfield and Blair into the fold under a little bit of a different model. And then in 18 and 19, we were awarded the school mental health grant through the state of Wisconsin, the DPI. And that really fast forwarded our growth as well in terms of how we wrote that grant, allowing us for the last three years to onboard five new schools each year. Um, again, a little bit of a blended model since that funding source has a, different, a few different requirements under it, but you can see under each year which school we brought on. And then this year, one of our school social workers, Mary Green, who services higher in Whittier, also took on uh, additional responsibility of helping coordinate some of the work and communicating with the school's point people at each site. 
So you heard me reference the United Way grant. Their Helping Kids Succeed grant is really specific. You can see at the bottom there, those four bullet points are the areas they aim to increase through that grant. We are not the only program by any stretch that this grant funds, but we're really falling under that student achievement and readiness. However, I would argue that PATH also does support family stability at times, as well as some community engagement and awareness. Um, that grant requires schools to be 50% or more free and reduced lunch to even be eligible. And there, it, it really substantially increases that PATH therapist, so they're no longer limited to what they can do just with what they're billing insurances. They can serve under or uninsured you know, students with those funds. They can attend school problem solving meetings, do formal informal consultations, training for staff, parents, students, and other kinds of awareness, advocacy, and navigation throughout the school community. There's also, of course, the DPI School Mental Health Grant that, again, we're in the third year of. Um, that first year across the state, they had a 3.25 million. They then increased it in 1920 to 6.5 across the state. However, the cap is still $75,000 per year. We have been awarded that um, for three years in a row now. It's a highly competitive grant. The main requirement of the DPI School Mental Health Grant is that you initiate or expand upon your current or not current uh, community mental health partnership. So you'll see that acronym CMHP, that's our therapy therapist, our, our community mental health provider, and that there's collaboration between your school mental health providers, so our psychologists, social workers, counselors, as well as the community mental health providers. Uh, we used, uh, our sustainability plan uh, was really great. Year one, every year we bring on, you know, so far, a new five set of schools. That first year is really about establishing relationships. The therapist is in the building, running small groups with the school psychologist or social worker or counselor, learning students, learning families, learning staff, building that readiness, knowledge base, and then in year two, they transition to that billable path model. Uh, additional services similar to the United Way grant, you know, it again it expands what that therapist can do in that building. So we've written this so, to allow those therapists in the buildings to mental uh, assist with mental health navigation. Uh, they've also disseminated a lot of different information and training for students and parents. We've done a few different mental health nights um, over the years. They've done classroom presentations, different types of pre, um, school presentations, as well as groups, and then problem solving team meetings. They also assisted with developing. We had a three year series, which I'll just touch on shortly later. Um, um, about staff training around trauma-informed care and supporting students' mental health needs in the classroom. And then we also purchased some social-emotional kits, second step, uh, in year one under the grant as well. So just something to celebrate. In the four years, we've received $345,000 in grants between United Way and the state, specifically earmarked for school mental health. Outcomes, right? A very important part of any kind of money or anything we're doing really uh, with a concerted effort in school, again, our really number one goal, as well as the state's, is increasing student access to treatment, uh, eliminating those barriers, getting students the support and help that they need. Uh, we now, with just PATH alone, have the capacity to serve over 115 students in our school walls. That number continues to grow every year as once we fill the seats, they're usually knocking on my door or Laura's, can we get more time? But that's you know a whole concerted effort to, to get another therapist in buildings and split their time accordingly. The United Way Helping Kids Succeed outcomes, they look at communication skills, social skills, self-regulation, and dif office discipline referrals. Um, they are reporting from the last outcome measures they get directly from Family Service that 100% of the students served within that grant did self-report increases in their measures of resiliency. The DPI grant also um, looks at the number of student contacts that community mental health provider had, as well as a school mental health provider. Our community health provider, as of April, and she'll be updating me with these numbers at the year end here, had 384 um, direct student contacts. And then uh, they're also looking at the number of referrals that were made to mental health providers. So this isn't just family service, but any kind of connections that were made. Of course, we fill 112 uh, PATH seats this year, and then there were also 27 external referrals that were followed up on. And then they're measuring how many students were in small groups. We had 68, and then students receiving classroom presentations, there was 297 as of April. So these are just some hard measures. Of course, what is really difficult to get a grasp on is the impact they have in the building with all of the mental health navigation, advocacy, awareness. Those pieces aren't as easy to get a handle on the impact of. We also did a series around supporting mental health and trauma-informed care. This started as a requirement from the federal and state safety grants that Dr. Cook had applied for and was awarded as a system here, and we just kept it going because it was so well received. You can see the different topics that were covered in each year under this series, 
And it really totaled about three hours of content in each year in those areas that we developed staff around. This was developed through student services. We had a committee in which we had two of our social workers trained through St. A's um, trauma certification. And they then in turn trained our student services to deliver this on site through our psych social workers and counselors. And then just some data tied to that. This is this year so far. I think this represents about 500 teachers, so it's not a full data set yet. But again, we've continued it for the three-year series because it was so well received. You can see some of the growth in their self-reported confidence in supporting students and emotional needs and some of their quotes um, as a result of receiving this series over three years of time. So I did pull two quotes from teachers that were here all three years. And where are we going as it, as it relates to the grant? So of course, maintaining the Helping Kids Succeed grant at East, Hadfield, and South. Uh, there might be opportunity. We're in discussions with them about looking at some different funding opportunities. We did apply for the next series of grants, the DPI. That's a two-year series, again, with a $75,000 cap. We would like to expand into eAchieve. That's one area we haven't really reached yet, and that has a huge potential knowing they service students all over the state of Wisconsin and in some areas that are very remote and difficult to find therapists. So there's a lot of potential there. And then a focus on our Hispanic students and families. We saw in our last youth risk behavior survey that 60% of our Hispanic students were um, self-expressing some kind of mental health issue or concern. So that was a population we chose to focus on for the next two years, should we be awarded the grant. And then of course, as always, continual, continual integration with our, our work of student services and our systems as a school whole. And then go ahead, Stacy, for the last slide. I, I would be remiss if I didn't address these other areas. I'm not going to go into detail, but these are other areas that 100% impact students' mental wellness. So our social emotional learning, we've had a lot of great work around that. Again, any of these I could probably do a whole other set of presentations on. Our alcohol, tobacco, and other drug abuse supports and services. Our substance use prevention committee has done a lot of great work in the district and community. Uh, our suicide prevention and intervention work course the work of our student services at a universal level selected and intensive and then I listed how many of each we have going into next school year our student services problem-solving meetings and our PSC problem-solving meetings are avenues in our school to also support students mental health and then one of the main data sources that we'll be getting every other year is the youth risk behavior survey uh, we'll certainly share that out it would have been done this spring the state delayed it for fall because of COVID and everything related to the pandemic so we'll be doing that this fall Love to open it up for questions. Mr. Brumgar. <clears throat> Not so much a question as a statement. I think this is extremely important for you to bring it, this to us. And I appreciate that. Uh, the, the, the problem is, is there's so many people that think education is a simple thing. We've got a bunch of teachers, we've got a bunch of kids, and we teach them. It's not at all that simple, and you've just you reminded us, and hopefully the public, that it is not that simple. And in particularly, I was proud to hear that Waukesha is out in front doing the work for the, the population that we have to do the work for. It's, it's more than just a group of kids out there, and the teachers have special needs to be able to pro provide for the help that is needed, and, and professionals that come in and help. I, I think sharing that information with us and sharing that information with the population is very, very critical because I think a lot of people just don't understand the depth of, of the, the complications we have to deal with. And, uh, and to hear you saying we're out in front, that's good. But, it, but as we all know, it's not enough. Um, guard, thank you for saying that. In 2009, I approached the uh, assistant superintendent, who I think was Jim Hasley at the time. Some of you might remember him. I had I attended. Jim. <laughs> I had a, attended a seminar, a professional seminar, as part of my, my continuing education requirements as a mental health provider. And what I learned at that seminar was that the primary manifestation of mental health issues or a traumatized child is learning disabilities. And I came out of this seminar and I called Jim. And I said, we need to have a conversation because we know how much effort, time, and money is spent on trying to overcome learning disabilities. And if we're missing the mental health component, we're really missing a big 
aspect of something that we can get a head start on. So thank, thank you. you for mentioning the importance of it. Great. Tacoma. Thank you, Greg. Um, well, Laura, thank you. Thank you for representing family services tonight and sharing um, the relationship that we've built uh, over time. You had mentioned 2009, and I want to take us back a little earlier than that. Um, I think one of the hardest decisions we had to make as a board, and I don't remember the exact year, maybe 2004, 2005, Bill, was whether or not to cut our counselors in elementary school. And we actually went from 16 elementary counselors to one. And I don't recall the number of school psychologists and the number of so social workers, but there weren't that many. And this is really a great success story to, to, to see how over the years we've overcome what I considered probably a super low point um, with respect to um, helping our students in this capacity. And our, our counselors did a, a fair amount of that work back then. But I am so pleased to see how, especially since Dr. Cook and Luke have been here, we have accelerated. So we, you know, here's the early, we made the cuts, whoop. You know, it was, it was, it was really ugly. It was ugly. And I remember hearing from parents who had students with very significant issues that they're trying to deal with, including, um, you know, giving credit to counselors saving their children's lives. And so as we've built up back up over the years, it is, we should feel really, you, Luke, you, and Joe, and everyone on the team, I don't know all the people on the team, and our partners should feel really good about what is going on now and should feel excellent about, and I know there's more students to reach, but holy cow, this is, my opinion, the best services I think we've ever delivered to students in this capacity. Um, so I, I, I thank you for all the hard work and the due diligence um, and for taking something that was really in need. We really had a super need over the years and you guys just have accelerated. My hat's off to you. Dr. Piazic. Um, thank you very much for this really informative and I appreciate just understanding the scope and the scale of the number of students that you're able to reach. Um, so I'm grateful for all the work that you're doing. Um, first, I just wanted to make sure I understand the numbers. If I understood correctly, um, Laura, you said we're, you served about 100 students, and that's in this past school year or school year to date. And then there was a reference to 115 students. Is that so we track those independently. Uh, my staff fill out a spreadsheet kind of of all the seats, and the last count I had was 112 this morning. So. It's not a different group, though. I just want to make sure I didn't misunderstand it's that. It's not a different group. My supervisor uh, reports on these numbers, and she's not a statistician, so it's somewhere in there between 100 and 112. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, though, then any of the one-on-one the -on -one counseling is being delivered by your staff? regardless of where that money is coming from. Right, that okay. number of 112 really represents only students who were set up with treatment plans, have treatment goals, are seen by the family service therapist. It does not account for all the students in small groups, all the universal work that's done um, by those therapists in conjunction with our school mental health providers in school as well. Okay. And the services that our mental health providers are offering to students is exactly the same type of service as the students would receive had they attended a session at our clinic in the community. It's just that we have planted that service in the school and have cut down on travel time, no shows, cancellations, which it, this particular group of students, the majority of them are being referred because they were not 
following through with referrals that had been occurring for them to see a community mental health provider. So it's insurance build service except for the grant funded activities that Luke referred to. Well, I think one of the advantage of, advantages of finding the students where they are is that they're not missing school. They're not taking long lunches or they're not you know, taking an afternoon or a morning away to attend to those appointments. So that's really important. Um, I'm curious also about the grant. So it's, a, it's hugely successful that we've been able to continue to get this grant to provide the services. What, what should we be looking at or thinking about in terms of st sustainability of this if given that, that it is so competitive? Right, so sustainability is actually a section that's built right into the application, and I felt like our sustainability plan was strong because we had the existing PATH program. So truly, when we think about that funding, that funding is paying for that first year in that cycle of those five schools in which that therapist isn't doing face-to-face -face therapy with students. They're doing the groundwork of building relationships, capacity, readiness, mental health awareness, and advocacy in the building. And then they transition because they'll know those students who they likely are going to have in therapy next year the transition to a billable model. So there are still gaps under a billable model, right, where you might have uninsured students who, um, for different reasons, aren't able to access that. But in certain grant schools, like Helping Kids Succeeds, we're able to supplement that a little bit. And I know Family Service has some financial considerations as well. Um, but that's the sustainability plan, and it's, it's very strong, and I think one of the strong points of our application, because we have the program that existed, so we can transition right into that. I do have just one more question, yeah, if I could. Um, and this is really just about, um, you know, in, in terms of the demand. So I think we all know this past year, there's not only been huge demand of outpatient mental health services, um, we're serving as many students as it sounds like we can. What has been your observation or understanding of maybe how the, the frequency of referrals and Right. I, I wouldn't be able to give you hard numbers, but I can tell you, like I kind of spoke to before, is once a student has a therapist, say they get a therapist one day a week to start, and that could be roughly six to seven students in, in the day, um, they quickly will fill those based on some of the factors Laura spoke to about, you know, students who aren't accessing it for various reasons and barriers. Um, but beyond that... That they are asking for more time. Sorry, now I kind of lost the first the intention of the question there. Could you repeat that? Uh, the demand in terms the of demand. So the demand is great, and you might be able to speak to this better, Laura. We are continually getting asked for more seats, but there is a tricky balance to that. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Laura. Well, I don't know how you're experiencing hiring here in the school district, but. Uh, there are fewer people who are applying for jobs. We uh, have been having difficulty filling um, spots that we have open. So if a school is asking to increase by a day and that ask comes in December or January, I diligently try to hire someone, but we don't have therapists who are sitting around waiting for an assignment. We give everyone assignment and they're working 40 hour weeks at time of hire. So a lot of that really depends on um, our ability to quickly hire someone and not to get too long winded or, or um, complicated with this, but there are insurance barriers for the providers as well, meaning that um, there are preferred provider networks, there is insurance credentialing that all therapists have to go through, and some insurance companies have freezes on who they're admitting into their networks. So it's kind of a complicated thing with having a provider ready to go to see students um, under their health insurance. So all of those things enter in. And then, although Family Service is our primary provider, our student services are really well acquainted with the rich variety of resources we have in Waukesha County to support mental health. So there are referral pathways to other agencies, other supportive um, you know, personnel and, and, and community partners that we would route them to should there not be seats available in school. So they certainly would exhaust those resources uh, as needed. I think the big curiosity this past year has been, are we missing students who need help because of the models and because of their attention to you know, the learning environment? Or um, are more students simply going straight to outpatient services? 
Right, and that, that's a big question. Uh, we do know, you know, mental health issues have been on the rise even pre-pandemic, so it's hard to kind of situate the pandemic in that need. Um, and that's where we look to our youth risk behavior survey. So I'll be, you know, anxiously awaiting that in the fall to see where things have shifted uh, for better or worse. Wait lists at our clinics, but I would say what we're seeing is about a 20% increase in demand for mental health services as a whole. And if there, if insurance barriers and payment for services was not a barrier, um, I think that we would have many, many more students engaged in therapy. But there are things like deductibles and co-pays and insurance, um, uh, just under-insured under um, families in the district too. And um, we, we don't have good answers for how to serve students who can't pay. Because, as I mentioned earlier, our nonprofit agency relies on program service fees. We don't have income coming in from other sources except grants and contracts and um, foundations through fund development and things like that. Thank you. Mr. Como. Yeah, you haven't I, had a turn go yet. Go ahead. Okay, so, sorry. <laughs> I'll go next. I'm just quick with, you know, raising my <laughs> hand. Sorry. <laughs> So you had mentioned that payment is a barrier. What are some of the other barriers? Stigma. And primarily the, the parents, I think, are the ones who are most concerned about that. I think that students would be willing to participate in the help that they need if they're struggling. Um, Parents are very concerned about engaging their, their children in mental health services for a variety of reasons. As great as school-based mental health services are, I think that parents are wrongly concerned that everyone in the school is going to know everything about their family and all of the private mental health issues that their student is experiencing. But Luke already spoke to um, the HIPAA guidelines apply in school-based, and we have to have specific releases of information to talk to anyone in the building about anything other than the fact that the student needs a pass to come to the office. But parents may hear that, but they don't really believe it or accept that that's the case. And I think that stigma for mental health problems is a problem everywhere across the United States. How, ha, how have we tried to combat that with our parents? Have we made an effort in that area? Uh, um, you know, I think back to some of the parent nights that our mental health therapist in year two of the grant conducted. Um, in year two, it was at the five schools, and then in year three, we opened that up. Actually, year one, it was at the five schools. Year two, we opened that up to a district-wide parent night. I know, Amanda Roddy, you helped with that screening of one of our films. So things like that really work to help end the stigma. Okay. All right. And then once a, a student begins the services, um, have we been keeping track of how that has potentially impacted their achievement? Do we look at so that we don't at all? draw those direct lines. We treat it, again, just like the student would be if they sought therapy outside of the school setting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Roddy. Yes, thank you. Um, Thank you both for your presentation. Um, I have a question just to make sure I understood it correctly. Um, the United Way Helping Kids Succeed program, um, that, <clears throat> those funds were going towards schools that had 50% or higher free and reduced lunch um, eligibility. Is that correct? There, for three schools right now, Hadfield, South, and East alternative. Okay. So those funds don't are just at those schools? So I kind of say those three schools are in the sweet spot, if you will, where they have traditional billable therapy, but then their grants supplemented so that therapist has a much further reach in those buildings while also seeing students face-to-face -face for therapy. Okay. So the reason I had asked for that um, clarity is to say um, we have other individuals in other schools. So any of the schools that don't, we they have access to the services and and stuff that that particular fund just goes to those particular schools are in the sweet spot correct got it okay 
Good. Um, the next question, um, I think Mr. Como had asked it of me, but if we were, you, you gave your list of um, goals going forward, but if we could grant you any wish tonight, and you said, where, where would you like to see Waksha go from here? What's the next big, you know, that's a loaded question. Be careful question. what you ask. <laughs> I know, I know, but I just want to get an understanding of what else might be out there, what else we can do. We're in the right direction, but... Right. I mean, for me, we've grown so significantly that I'm just very impressed and proud of the collective work just to where we are today. Um, but if I could have anything in the world, right, of course, uh, expanding to E-Achieve is a big, a big one for me and for us as a system. And then thinking about more opportunities like the Helping Kids Succeed grant where we can get more schools in that sweet spot. Yeah, I agree with that. It's very distressing when we know that there are students in need of mental health counseling, but we don't have financial resources to provide that counseling to them. Our therapists need to be paid. And, you know, I, I spoke to that a little bit earlier. So as much as I think our therapists have the heart to want to provide free services, our finance department would not allow that to, to occur. So those grant funds are very important. And also to your point or to your question is that's really where we then talk about what student services can can support realistically in the building. Of course, it will not be the same level um, of a of a therapist, but there are certainly a lot of supports that they can exhaust as well. Okay. Well, thank you. And the reason I, I asked that is um, we have living proof of community partners here. So if there's somebody in our community that's hearing this tonight and said, "Hey, I know something," or "I know someone," let's get the ask out. Absolutely. So thank you. Luke, Laura, could you tell me what the parent commitment is once a student has been selected uh, for the program? Well, of course, parental consent is required for participation in mental health treatment. Parents are always involved in the initial assessment interview so that they can uh, provide the therapist with background information about the family and help to formulate the treatment goals. Our I'm going to say our requirement, but I'm saying that very loosely. Our requirement is for parents to participate minimally every six times or three months, whichever is longer. But in all honesty, we struggle with parental engagement because of the population that we're targeting for these services, which have been historically difficult to engage families or families who have their own barriers and have not been able to get their child into outpatient therapy. So under the telehealth treatment model that we were forced into, the blessing in the telehealth treatment model is that we've been able to engage parents that were otherwise difficult to engage because they would be in the next room if the child was at home we could call them on the phone or they could do facetime so there are some requirements that our state license um, puts upon us for parental engagement and for person-to-person -person contact with parents we have to document very carefully the reasons and uh, that parents aren't engaged and all attempts that we've made to engage parents. But there's a significant number of parents who do not show up in person. Would that disqualify a student if there's no parent engagement? No, I asked that question of a state auditor a few years ago. Um, if we haven't been able to successfully engage the parent in the face-to-face -face sessions that we are requiring them to, must we discharge a student for lack of compliance? And they, of course, said no, but that leaves us in this kind of nebulous area where we just have to document, document, document diligent efforts. And Luke mentioned Mary Green as a, a support to the PATH program. She, and in, through her advocacy, has really helped to engage school staff in helping our therapists to reach out to families and in, engage parents. Because so, they already have that connection, or they have more of a connection they and relationship do. than what someone from outside would, yes. They do, and that's very helpful. We don't have that assistance in the clinic, so that's very helpful. And then I can't thank the two of you enough for just the service that you're providing for our students, the district. 
Um, I mean, if we don't have mental health, to me, we don't have much. I mean, if we're not addressing those issues, so many other things come way down the line. And um, you should be extremely proud of your efforts. I know you are. Um, you probably don't see it as work because it's your passion. Um, but uh, I really want to thank you for all your work behind the scenes in making this program so successful. And I'm sure it's a model for other districts throughout the state, which you also should be very proud of, and I'm sure you are. So keep up the great work. Thank you for the re uh, reporting out tonight. And we certainly want to invite you back at any time to uh, give us an update on anything that is happening. Um, Thank you. Yes. We are under other business already. Um, recommendations for future committee meetings. From anyone on the committee. Ms. Landish, could you just update me on some of the things that will that are coming up that we're gonna that we're going to be addressing? Testing my memory here, Mr. Dietz. I guess I'll just direct um, I have like one thing I remember, but well, I, I will refer to the two recommendations made at last month's meeting in yep. particular. Uh, yep. Dr. Piasek asked for uh, an update around the high school failure data, and so that will be given at the July board meeting. Huh? as well as uh, Mrs. Roddy asked about, oh yes, thank you. Um, Amanda asked about um, curriculum and where parents could find it accessible at uh, Forward Facing View. And so uh, rather than bring that in June when people probably are not looking at curriculum during the summer months, we're gonna bring that actually in September to this team. And then we'll also be getting um, an update on technology and have a report from them as well over the summer. Is that correct? So as the board president, maybe uh, Mr. Como can speak to this. We, um, in essence, expunged the technology committee as a separate uh, committee. And so any technology agenda items um, that come through Steve Schloman will also come through this subcommittee as well. So I guess I would advise the board members here that should there be any relatable items regarding technology as well as teaching and learning that you voice those at this time in the meeting under other business and then we'll make sure that Steve Schloman and his team uh, work with us collaboratively on that shared document as we plan for future board meetings. One of mine is the difficulties that we have in this particular room with technology. And um, it seems we have an ending tonight, I don't think, but um, typically every single meeting that I've been to, there's some issue. And I understand that it can't be perfect, but maybe just to uh, know that it's being addressed and um, you know the improvements that are being planned and um, being considered. Not that the... Uh, the people aren't there to solve those problems. So I have full confidence that they are, but um, just to be reassured, uh, not only as a board, but uh, as a public that views a lot of these meetings to um, make sure that uh, two-way communication is existing. I am aware that Steve and his team have already worked on that per the feedback from you at the full board meeting, but I will certainly write this down as something to give the board an update on um, from Steve's perspective. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Just want to um, thank everyone for your involvement and participation um, as we wind down another school year. And as I look out into the group that's uh, sitting in the back, um, and Stacy and Jody, um, I couldn't be prouder to be on, on this board working with super talented committed, dedicated individuals as all of you are. Um, you are just so professional and so amazing in the work that you do that often goes unnoticed. And I just wanna let you know that uh, we appreciate your leadership, you stand out, you do great work, and your achievements are um, endless. And uh, I don't think I could ask for a better group of people to work with. We can't get our job done if we're not working with you. And I feel like we have that kind of relationship and we wanna just continue to build on that. And um, 
you know, great things are happening in this district because of the relationship with, that we have with the staff and the top-notch professionals that we have, especially in this room tonight. So thank you very much for another great year and for all the work that you do. With that, our meeting is going to be adjourned. Our next Teaching and Learning Committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, July 6th at 6 p.m. here in the boardroom. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.